Welcome back to the Switzer program. Treasury is anticipating a significant decline in mining investment by the middle of the decade, but concedes it's difficult to pinpoint the exact peak. So, with the mining investment boom coming off the boil, our resources are still a buy. And we're joining me in studio to answer that and plenty more. Rudy Filipek van Dijk, the editor of FN Arena. Rudy, I wonder if resources have been a buy for a while now. I mean, they haven't exactly been an outperformer. No, no, I, I think there's a... Um there's definitely a, uh, a significant change uh, post the midst of 2008, I would say, and, 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 and the years leading up to that. One, one of the things I've observed is that the whole discussion about resources tends to be very narrow, and, mm. and everyone is looking at China and that's resources or yeah. not. The irony of that is that I'm, I've actually been quite constructive on China myself, but I've not been constructive on resources at all. And that's not a contradiction at all. So why the breakdown in, in popular thought that if you've got good growth in China, yes. good demand for commodities, it means BHP Rio are going to hit, you know, sixty and a hundred dollars yes. a share yeah. price. Well, I, well, my suspicion is that um, China has played such a, a pivotal role in the years leading up to 2007, 2008, that the whole thing about resources has been so now so closely linked to China. The China is it? China is it? Yeah. Right? And if China slows down, that means no resources. If China uh, accelerates, that means resources. But it's actually, it's actually not true, because what people forget is that under any circumstances, the, 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 the question about resources is, is made up between demand and supply. And it's the, the play between the two that defines whether resources will have a good time or not. But isn't the concern being that if you don't have a China that is growing at what is considered a, a good rate, then that demand side of the equation doesn't look quite as, as rosy? Well, that is to a certain extent true, um, but, and obviously that's also a, a mind change we've had in, in financial markets mm. as well, is that don't underestimate the, the humongous stimulus that China put in, in working when, when the world was going to hell in a handcart. <laughs> and and you, could, you could argue that has pulled forward so much in, in demand artificially that temporarily things looked rosier than they actually were yeah. in, in, in practice. The other thing also is what a lot of people underestimate is that in the years leading up to 2007, we had probably for the first time in history a synchronized uh, boom amongst all the major developed economies. Like Europe was booming, US was booming, and China was booming. Now Japan wasn't, but Japan was at that stage for 20 didn't, years, really, so. <laughs> didn't really matter anymore. But if you realize that Europe in those days was a bigger economy than the US in size, the US was booming and China was uh, upcoming and booming. Now that's the demand side. And what people forget is the average price for iron ore in the 90s was less than $20. Yeah. The average price for, for crude oil we forget this, was $19 yeah, in the 90s. Yeah. We're now talking $100. The, where, where Australia has been um, privileged, I would say, is that in this whole commodity perspective, I mean, supply is already caught up. Yeah. If you look at uh, the price charts for, let's say, a nickel, uh, it used to be 50, 50,000, mm -hmm. 5, 5 zero. Nowadays it's 14, 15, I mean, that's a massive fall. I mean, can a nickel producer uh, produce profits at 50,000? Hell yeah. <laughs> Can they do it at 14? Probably not, right? Very little. And that's, so supply is already caught up in a lot of, in a lot of uh, uh, ways. We have three laggards in, in the whole commodity spectrum. And Australia has been privileged that those three happen to be very important for Australia. Right? A lot of, I mean, BHP and Rio are not the only major resources companies in the world. They happen to be the best performing one, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and, and, and BHP is by far the, uh, the best one. And mm. you, you also see that, I mean, if shareholders here are complaining about rewards, you don't want to talk to shareholders who had, who had some of the other, I mean, look at the price chart of Alcoa or Vale over the past few years. I mean, you get a heart attack so if I, you were a shareholder. I'm confused then. So on the one hand, you know, you, I'm, I'm trying to figure out then if yes. you think the miners, the big guys, are a good buy. Because on the one hand, you're saying you can't just think about China because there's a lot no. more. But on the other hand, yes. you're talking about a dramatic fall off in commodity prices yes. because volume, which we know is happening in the iron ore space, yes. is catching up yes. with demand. Well, what, what has happened in those three is that they all had interruption on the supply side. Mm. Yeah. Like 
Copper has now two years in a row looked like it was having a bad year. It sort of started off on a bad footing this year. And oh, all we have is two major mines within, with production interruptions now that might improve copper's perspectives for the rest of the year. Mm. I mean, that's why copper stocks all of a sudden start rallying. With crude oil, ostensibly it's happening now. And I mean, it's, it's around $100. People were, people were expecting 150 not that long ago. Well, I was not amongst them, but anyway. And I would think that over the past three years, $100 is probably what you should expect for, for crude oil. I mean, obviously, brand is the new, the new benchmark. Iron ore, I have no doubt that we were heading lower. The only, que lower. the only question is exactly the only question how fast now and far. I think everyone is sort of convinced that we, we will be talking uh, 90 or 80 dollars a ton at some stage. What does that but leave? Is that, but is some that going to happen is that, exactly? Is that going to happen in, in 2015 or 16, mm. or is that going to happen in 17? But it will happen. Right? Also, because the growth in China is slowing and will be slower, we we'll probably. I mean. But it's slowing from such a high level that it doesn't yes, there need to be a yes. readjustment of expectations yes, of what is a good level of it's growth. It's true, but there's, there's two things happening there. One is that if the rate of growth is slowing, then um, supply can catch up much easier. Mm -hmm. yeah, if China is growing at 14%, which it was at some stage, and in those days demand was closely linked to the rate of growth, well, you, you try to improve your mind. You're always by playing catch up. You try to improve your production by 14%. And it's not happening. But that's yeah? what did happen in terms of the, the massive investment phase. In those, in the, in those years, the yes. But now you see a lot of commodities growing by maybe 3% a year. Mm. Men's supply can catch up. Where does that leave a BHP bulletin? Just just below thirty-four dollars at the moment. Yes, well, helped by the currency at this moment. I would yeah. think that normally uh, BHP would, would be probably around thirty dollars now if it was not for the currency. So this, we're now in the phase that finally the currency is benefiting the miners and might benefit a lot mm. depending on how, how much it drops. I've been writing a few stories about this, and and, and I do think that at some point the market will uh, revise its views on Rio and BHP. Down. Uh, upwards, upwards. For, for the simple reason that, see the share market is normally about growth. It's about not what, what profits you make, but yeah, how does that compare to what you made last year and to what you're going to make next year? That will be a battle that the miners will have increasingly difficulty with in, in winning that one. I mean, you can win it one year because you can cut costs, you can increase so your production, can do that. but in a, in, a, in a falling price environment, it's a really tough task. But what They would argue volume, you know, they've, they've got the benefits of scale. Yes, but um, that's not the real story. The real story in both of them, and that's where Australia invests, I think, are a little bit lucky in both, both companies as well, is they are the lowest producers in iron ore. Hmm. They produce at 50, 60, whatever. So that means all those volumes they put in place, they will, over time, maybe not necessarily create a lot of growth, but they will create a lot of cash. So those companies, between now and 2020, will at some point start generating a humongous amount of cash. And, and I mean, is the question is, do they then start to return more of that cash shares or do they look at investing yes. over the cycle? Well, look at the example of Woodside. Um, too many people, I think, drew from that example, oh, PHP, we are Everyone's going to start giving yes. special dividends. No, because the problem with Woodside, well, not the problem, but the advantage of Woodside was, if you take it from that perspective, is their major projects were running off the next one doesn't look very attractive, so then they go, well, we might as well give some cash to shareholders. Yeah. But BSP and D Rio, they have a different position still. They still have some stuff to invest. But in a few years' time, and especially when you, when you, when you were talking lower prices, they probably will have the same response as, as Woodside has and go like, there's no use. When, when Iron Ore was at 90 or $95, there's little use for them to start investing another $10 billion in, in ramping up production. I mean, they might as well just uh, milk what they have, but that means they will have a lot of cash. So, so the question then remains, yes. it's the same one from, the, you know, from 10 minutes ago, because people <laughs> sitting back looking, I agree with you, I don't agree yes. with you. Does that mean you would buy BHP in Rio at the moment? I well, mean, it's my favorite sentence, it's what you want. Yeah? <laughs> and, and, and what do you want? And, and here's the point, here's the point. If people buy Rio or BHP on the expectation that Rio or both of them go, go to $100, mm -hmm. yeah, wrong, right? it's not going to happen. The way things are stacked up, both probably have their peak profits behind them. They will, they will not reach that again. But now the currency is dropping, BHP share price is around 4% uh, dividend yield for next year. 
that's that that that's that stuff looking attractive because they also have accumulated a lot of franking mm. uh, credits. credits. So all of a sudden, the big Australian is going to offer you four percent plus franking with a profile that they will. Well, I'm pretty much certain that that's going to happen. They will increase their dividends at a much rapid pace than the banks will. On that note, we've got there. <laughs> we've run <laughs> short of time, Rudy. So it's great to talk. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Rudy Philippek van Dijk from FN Arena. We're going to take another break. When we come back, we'll find out why the Tax Institute is calling for a more simplified taxation system.